Hello, everyone, um, and good afternoon. This will be a. Uh, this is supposed to be done by my professor. This is my professor's group. IOE is the Internet of Everything group. And we have an ERC project uh, which we titled Minerva, Communication Theoretical Foundations and of Nervous System towards Bio-Inspired Nano Networks and ICT-Inspired Neural Treatment. ICT stands here for Information and Communication Theory. Um, so uh, there's this uh, big developing paradigm of IoT, and uh, under IoT, uh, there's also this alternative paradigm called uh, IOBNT, which is Internet of Bio Nano Things, uh, which still falls under IONT, Internet of Nano Things, in which uh, we are actually trying to communicate uh, the data from the nano world up to our uh, up to the internet that we know, the uh, digital uh, place that we enjoy. Uh, so you want to connect nanomachines and biological entities, which are also mostly composed of nanomachines, uh, to this wider internet. And the unique challenges for this is uh, we need to understand how these nanomachines are communicating with each other on this nanoscale, and uh, what are the techniques they use for networking, and can we actually try to communicate with these networks? And, uh, well, uh, developing the machinery to do that is a major challenge. And uh, the other challenge, after receiving enough data from these uh, networks, the networks has so much data uh, enclosed into a so tiny space, uh, the data that you would need to collect in order to uh, observe any meaningful network would be gigabytes per second, maybe even higher, as um, was mentioned earlier that you got so much uh, DNA data, for example, uh, being uh, stored in some little space and so little mass. So, uh, Internet of Nano Things was uh, shown by World Economic Forum as one of the emerging technologies in 2016. And then by IEEE Communication Society, IoT, IOE, and Molecular Communications have been listed as uh, one of the top. Uh, trends of 2017 in communication technologies. Um, so, uh, what we know is, what we have come to understand is that we are actually composed of nanomachines that are sort of seamlessly interacting with each other. And there are so many different ways of doing it, from neural spike channels to hormone, hormonal networks which go through up the whole body and cardio cardiomyocyte channel, which we understand better, for example. And it actually uh, is logical to think that so many networks have found their solutions after so much uh, evolution. Uh, they have already present, they're already presenting us with the best of solutions in terms of uh, networking nanoscale devices and even producing on scale devices. So uh, when you think of an artificial uh, nano network, you would consider these at least, this is the smallest bit of the picture, in which you would have a transmitter unit, a receiver unit, and something that they communicate with, which is usually a molecule or maybe multi multitude of molecules. And there is a channel in between which most of the case, it can be airborne, but it is mostly uh, a fluidic channel in which uh, molecules would diffuse. So uh, we have this <coughs> uh, knowledge, this accumulated knowledge of traditional communications, and we want to actually sort of compare it with molecular communications and see what can we learn from molecular communications in nature, in our bodies, and what can we actually effect by our theories of traditional communications of electromagnetics. So even though everything is very much different, the carrier is electromagnetic waves versus molecules, 
speed of propagation is light speed versus very low diffusion speeds. And uh, the environment is usually, this is prop for traditional communications, electromagnetic waves, they could go even in space, but mostly they're airborne. And in molecular communications, we mostly see aqueous, but it can be airborne in the case of pheromones, for example, uh, animals connecting through pheromones. Um, so uh, there are examples of nanomachines being built, like uh, by application of external electromagnetic field, uh, you can create these rotors. And uh, this is a, well, maybe I should do this. Um, so this is a smart drug delivery thing. You can think of this as a cancer cell, and if you detect some proteins, your nanomachines would attach, then uh, would dis put in some RNA or some proteins or some specific molecule. And uh, sorry, this is from the blood vessel, and then these uh, molecules target the cell and cause it to go undergo apoptosis. Um, so uh, these nanomachines, out of these nanomachines that we might have like this, these are very simple. We then have nano networks, which is a much wider topic, because then you would have lots of communicating nanomachines to perform a common task. And one of the questions is, is there enough place down there to communicate and do all these? But it's a famous, actually, very uh, famous quote that there's plenty of space down there. Uh, pre there's plenty of room at the bottom. So there, there is enough room for com uh, extracting communication networks. We know that. So we say we believe the answers are already inside us, and we are sort of built by these small networks, which actually use the space on the bottom. And well, in Minerva, uh, we are considering to actually uh, find theoretical foundations for the, we are interested in the neurospike communication in the nervous system. We just uh, dampen down to a specific uh, topic, uh, specific network. Um, and it n neural network has been chosen. and. Um, so we are uh, interested in theorizing, modeling the nanoscale neurospike communication channels. And then after, uh, after modeling all the channels, then make it a multi-terminal neurospike communication channel and nervous non-network investigation. So investigate the networks. And uh, in order to uh, validate our model, we want to build this nervous nanonetwork simulator, which is four ends. We call n 4 sim. Haven't put in here, but we'll see it somewhere. Uh, to have a fast running simulator, which can actually simulate large networks of uh, neurons and maybe astrocytes involved as well, and their synaptic communications, axonal propagations, and everything. And uh, after this would contribute a lot in our understanding of the existing uh, mechanisms uh, inside a nervous nanonetwork, then uh, we would like to uh, actually uh, do two things. I design ICT-based nanoscale uh, communication systems which are inspired from biology. And then, after uh, designing these ICT-based theories of uh, these communication systems, try to implement the ICT ideas uh, theory to envision ways of neurotreatment. So this is something, um, it's, it's there is no one way of doing this. You really need to uh, go through the system and see what might be the cause of for one problem and try to simulate it and then try to apply some communication theoretical uh, analysis on 
well, the information is not being propagated at this level because of this kind of things, and what's the, how can we uh, resolve this? We can actually find, we believe that we can find ICT-based uh, solutions to cure diseases, neural diseases. And that's actually been going on. So this, I won't take long. These are the four tasks that we had just written in the previous slide. Uh, we are getting outcomes. Some tasks are already finished. Uh, we are actually in the middle of making the network simulator. And also in the final stage of, uh, we have this proposal of making an artificial snaps. And our plan is to go through and make an artificial snap. So this is a um, nanoscale neurospike communication channel. Uh, we like to model our nervous system like that, but it's actually even more complicated than this. But the main idea is there's an input neuron uh, which uh, creates an action potential at some time, and that action potential travels down the axon through all, to all the synapses, synaptic ends. And in the synapse, upon the receive, reception of the electrical signal, pulse, uh, a vesicle is released to the synaptic cleft which is a very narrow band of 10 nanometers across. Uh, and those uh, neurotransmitters that are released from the presynapse go and attach uh, to receptors on the postsynaptic wall, which triggers ion channels to open, and ion flow happens. Uh, ion flows into, positive ions flow into uh, the postsynapse to uh, to uh, decrease the voltage across the membrane. And these data, they, all these uh, ion current data, they all come from this, these dendrites. And there is some sort of dendritosomatic, it's called, uh, calculation that goes on here. And if these ions come and uh, trigger a specific place around inside where this pulse generator is, uh, it causes the, another synaptic pulse, and then that propagates like that. And this is the basic block of the network. Uh, these guys actually, one neuron would com uh, communicate to 10,000 of neurons, and in terms receive information for, from 10,000 neurons as well, in most of the cases. So it's a very non-trivial, highly non-linear, uh, and very big uh, network that we're dealing with here. And well, we hope that information is, is encoded in spike trains. We think that, and we actually have proofs of that. But what the coding scheme and everything is, even that is sort of non, not known so much. Um, so this is just an enhanced picture of what we, what I had shown. Uh, these are the specific models that are used in, uh, in trying to model the behavior of these, of these channels and networks. Uh, so uh, this is too mathematical and too detailed, so I will not go too much into this kind of stuff. But this is our theoretical modeling that's been going on. Uh, we did the vesicle release model, uh, which occurred in the in in the synapse, and uh, the general system model uh, with uh, uh, the type of receptor dependent um, some. Uh, specific waveforms that are being sent as ions were flowing through. And then we, of course, after getting all these uh, models, we want to actually uh, provide some estimates on uh, what kind of communication channel we have and what's the capacity of the channel, how much information can be put through it. And so it, these are uh, part of that study. Um, this is a, a study done by one of my colleagues in which we actually 
Earth, Earth views earthworms as test subjects. I think they don't require any ethical issue at all. So <laughs> you can just do anything on them. Actually, if you cut them, they multiply, become two of them. Uh, very strange creatures, but these are preferred because they are known to have this very large and very simple nervous system uh, with, to which you can really attach by very simple electrodes. And, you know, uh, just to be able to validate some of our models in this basic experiment, this uh, experiment that was done. And after getting all the model done, it's actually one of the important questions we have is how to put them into a ner nervous network simulator. The reason is uh, uh, the behavior is highly dependent on the, uh, on the parameters uh, of the sim single neurons and their connections. And we want to be as realistic as possible, so there's this diffusion process that goes on. So do we want to, we don't want to go through that diffusion process at each time because there are like millions or billions of synapses in, even in a, a small network of small nervous system. And uh, running sim diffusion simulations through all of them is impossible. So what we're doing is, uh, we are based on our theoretical models. We are trying to build up uh, deterministic models uh, that sort of uh, capture the average behavior of this stochastic in nature process and go for the average uh, behavior of uh, these channels. Uh, this a lot of things need to be incorporated still. One of the most important things is synaptic plasticity because that's how these things regulate themselves uh, in order to change behavior. And you know, learning happens through synaptic plasticity. And it is really important to pinpoint how these things, how the plastic, synaptic plasticity is actually, uh, should be seen in the models, in the equations. Uh, there's an effort going through that, but uh, what we are trying to do is just put everything in libraries in terms of input-output relations so that we don't have to simulate every cell again and find a way to uh, create a fast-running but still true to the molecular dynamics uh, network simulator. And this is m 4 sim. We are actually in the middle of doing this. So there is some simple models. This is one of the from the top paper, um, trying to do this uh, in a case of a, a model of a diffusion based model of some synapse, which is assumed to be like a real synapse. Uh, and also, we have done work on uh, uh, in an artificial uh, the channel of an artificial synapse, the molecular dynamics. And the artificial synapse was actually a synapse that is closed uh, from the walls, thinking that if we have an artificial synapse, if we want to uh, sort of bring it about into a living system, it needs to be biocompatible. And one of the most important things is that maybe the neurotransmitters we'll use uh, in that artificial synapse uh, will not be biocompatible at all. So maybe it is a good idea to even also to not to run out of uh, neurotransmitters. Maybe make our synapse close and just leave neurotransmitters and suck them back in to the pool where they were ejected from. And that has already shown one thing very crucial, which is the suction of neurotransmitters from the synapse is actually plays a huge role. Uh, if the suction doesn't happen, uh, then the capacity of the channel falls dramatically and you end up having uh, no signal information being transferred across that synapse at all. Uh, so that can actually, for example, accumulation of uh, large molecules next to synapses can prevent actually molecular uh, neurotransmitters to diffuse out and just kill this link uh, effectively. 
Um, so this is actually, this shows us one of the ways to have disease, neural disease, which is just uh, having a bad cytoplasm, uh, not ex exoplasm, uh, which actually sort of blocks all the uh, movement of the molecules. So uh, what do we want to get out of this? One of the uh, major thing studies that uh, lots of groups actually are uh, going for is spinal cord injury uh, and the treatment of spinal cord injury in which you hope to get data from above from the cerebral side uh, of the injury and get the data across to the below injury side to the rest of the body and uh, just repair the broken uh, the broken line and uh, and hopefully uh, the patient will uh, gain its ability to of movement and right now there are many ways that are being envisioned like epidural stimulation and reading data directly from the brain but one of our visions is actually just uh, put up uh, these artificial systems which directly take data from one neuron to the next one. But this is like, this is a very futuristic thing. Um, but still, even though very futuristic, that is actually sort of uh, being done. Uh, there are ways of doing stuff. So this is a way of, uh, it's, it's, uh, towards an artificial synapse you would want to actually sense data and make it an electronical uh, data out of it. This is a work done by our friend uh, he's, who's doing PhD here right now. Um, and these biofets and uh, silicon nanowire fets that he has uh, built actually have the capability of uh, receiving some molecular information. The thing is, which molecular information, how good is the reception? There are so many problems to be tackled yet, of course. And um, on top of Minerva, we have also uh, gotten this ERC uh, POC uh, grant in which we are actually proposing to do high resolution neural interfaces using graphene. Uh, well, graphene has this uh, many uh, things that we like, many properties. Uh, you can actually manipulate atomic scale so that uh, you can really have high special resolution on graphene. There are many methods that we are thinking, actually nearly all based on graphene. Uh, we, can, we hope to uh, create highly localized fluctuations in ion concentrations or maybe neurotransmitter concentrations as well, detect them and also generate them. And that would be the basis of communicating with the neuron actually. Um, and one, uh, this will of course will get us towards Internet of Everything region which will uh, make possible the bio-cyber interfaces that have so many applications actually. So this is a childish picture but this really is the sort of the kind of idea that we have. You can think of these as uh, these. if you see the red lines these are these small grids and think them think of them uh, sub-micron scale so uh, sub-micron versus sub-micron and you really want to collect data from one place of the nervous system and then put it to a lower side and then restore the communication in the spinal cord, for example. And one of the, actually, this looks, sounds very feasible because of the biocompatibility studies as well. Um, so this graphene-based interfaces do not alter target nerve cells study actually shows that uh, graphene is highly biocompatible. Uh, and it actually promotes neurite growth towards itself. So one problem in interfacing is when you put a, something there, uh, just, you're not connecting to the neurons themselves. But since neurons are dynamic, you expect the neurons to come to you. 
and that's why you need the neuroid sprouting. Uh, they will come to you and interface with you, hopefully. Um, so in the proof of concept project, we will chase for this high resolution neural interfaces, which is actually a very hot topic. Um, do last in within last year, in actually within this year, 2017, DARPA has commissioned six funded. Yeah, DARPA has funded six. Uh, projects towards high resolution neural interfaces uh, and spent about more than 100 million dollars just this year and this is just DARPA. Elon Musk has created this spin-off company called Neuralink which is trying to do the same thing. So our competition actually in this proof of concept scenario is massive. It's what is fun to have. Um, so, what are the broader impacts of Minerva? Uh, we are envisioning to uh, produce bio-inspired nanoscale molecular communication systems for the vision of IOBNT, uh, ICT-based nervous disease diagnosis tools, and this will utilize and force him. Then, uh, ICT-inspired treatment techniques. Uh, we have ICT inspired treatment techniques for the no normal electromagnetic networks that we have. A similar stuff can be done uh, in human body as well because it's a communication network as well. For example, jamming communication of cancer cells to, pro to prohibit them from doing metastasis, undergoing metastasis kind of stuff. And thank you. This is the group. This is our professor and the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you.